Welcome to Kiss the Reviews. I'm Armando, that's Corey, and today we're doing 2000s The Replacements. Before we get started, if you want to follow me or Corey on Twitter, you could follow me at Junior D's. You could follow Corey at Corey underscore Idol. As always, if you want to follow the show, you could follow the show on both Twitter and Instagram at Kiss the Reviews. So let's get into this movie. We're going to start with the cast here um, because the cast might be longer than the actual review. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's jump into the cast of The Replacements. This film stars Keanu Reeves as Shane Falco, Gene Hackman as Jimmy McKinney, Brooke Langton as Annabelle Farrell, Orlando Jones as Clifford Franklin, Faison Love as Jamal, Michael Talaferro as Andre, Ace Yonamaini as Fumiko, Troy Winbush as Walter Cochran, David Denman, also Roy from The Office as Brian Murphy, John Favreau as Bateman, Michael Jace as Wilkinson, Reese Ifens as Nigel Gruff, and Brett Cullen as Eddie Martell. Buried lead, man. That's who I've sculpted my hair after. <laughs> And I see you wore your Shane Falco jersey specifically for this review, and I appreciate that. Yes, I did. I got the the hair of Martel, the fucking jersey of Falco, and the goddamn body of Nigel Gruff. I, <laughs> so I'll be honest. When I was watching this movie, and he's in the he's in the locker room, and he's just like in his underwear, I was like, yeah. "Holy shit, that's basically Corey's body type." <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's pretty much what I look like in tidy whities Oh, I love it. I love it. Well, let's get into this movie. Um, it's been a minute since I've seen it, but I've seen this a million times. I I don't even think I really needed to watch this to actually review it, uh, no. just because I know it by heart at this point. But this is one of my favorite sports comedies mm -hmm. around. It's I, the whole thing is just done really well. Yep. It, it's not, I don't know, it's not incredibly over the top. The one thing, and it'll come up during the review, the one thing I didn't like uh, was some of the, the writing and not even like the, uh, the dialogue or anything. It was the actual like football stuff that annoyed me. That's okay. Literally the only thing. But let's just let's just jump into this, man. This movie opens with Shane Falco, a former quarterback at Ohio State who got blasted in a bowl game and didn't find much success in the pros. He's doing his job cleaning the bottoms of rich people's boats. He finds a metal trophy football that is his and pretends that he's playing football again while scuba diving underwater sure why not as you do i will say this for the youngsters out there um back in the day an ohio state quarterback getting blown out in a bowl game pretty much status quo <laughs> yeah that tracks. happened a lot yeah yeah that definitely and then, tracked. Th then we got our shit together but yeah it took a minute so yeah. back when this movie was made this was very accurate and this is the second movie where Keanu has been a quarterback for Ohio State. Yes. So I want to know, because it's different writers, so I want to know, does Keanu have a thing for Ohio State? Why me? It's, what, five years earlier was this bowl game, and he still mm -hmm. is. A, he would be more known as a, a uh, like a pro football bust than, remember that bowl game? Yeah. But that's all they talk about is the goddamn bowl game. Yeah, because Gene Hackman even makes mention, like, you know, you should have been holding a clipboard your first year instead of trying to carry the team. Yeah. And which implies he got drafted. Yes. They would have just yeah. left it where he got, like, three concussions in the Sugar Bowl, because back also in those days, nobody cared what happened to your head. Get out there no. and play, young man. So if they would have left it where he had three concussions in the Sugar Bowl and – therefore could not go to the nfl nobody would take a chance on him 
then it makes a little bit more sense that the whole footsteps Falco and the sugar bowl thing is actually haunting him. Yeah. However, in this case, it doesn't really track. Yeah, no, exactly. While we see this, there's also a professional football season going on. And we see the Washington Sentinels playing in what is their last game because the players are going on strike afterwards. The one thing they do portray well with this is everybody shitting on the athletes for being like these rich, spoiled pricks, which Martell, right. Martell in this is. The rest but, of the team is. That's, and that's my one beef with this, actually. This whole movie is how they portray that. Yeah. Because not every athlete is like, you know how much insurance costs on a Ferrari motherfucker? Come on, man. <laughs> A lot yeah. of these guys are, they're very, I mean, actually not a lot of them. They are all very real people. Yes. And they come from very real places. That's not always in a position of that upper yeah. echelon. Like, I know how much. The, no, dude. My these guys, favorite. These guys are actually trying to earn a living. I don't have a problem with salaries athletes make. I've never been oh, that no. guy. No, me neither. Me <clears> neither. But, and, and the one really funny thing that I don't think is meant to be comedic uh, but it is to me, but it's super accurate is the next scene, which is the next day, Ed O'Neill, played by Jack Warden, who is the owner of the Sentinels, is discussing with Jimmy McGinney, him being the head coach again, and he was their former coach, but he got into a fight with the former star quarterback from the team and yada yada. Yep. But he makes a comment here to McGinney. I'm talking about a team of poor nobodies who play to win, not a bunch of bitchy millionaires. Which makes me laugh because these owners are billionaires bitching about millionaires who are bitching about their <laughs> exactly. salary. That whole that whole <clears throat> situation I find hilarious. Oh yeah, that shit's an ap episode of Falcon Crest. <laughs> not real life. Hell yes. This is too where if you're a if you're a football fan, you should start drawing parallels to the owner of the team being Jerry Jones and Gene Hackman's character being like Tom Landry. That's where I go is a Jerry Jones, Al Davis type. Yeah. And yeah, because yeah. Uh, Jimmy McGinty, Gene Hackman has you know the traditional suit and tie on and his hat and that just screams Tom Landry. Oh, a hundred percent. 100%. Old school coach. I want to do it my way kind of thing. And Yeah, exactly. He, and he tells um, the owner, Ed O'Neill here, that he wants to find his own replacement players. He's been keeping an eye. He hasn't been coaching for a while, but he, he's been keeping an eye on some players, including like soccer players and sumo wrestlers for some strange reason. Um but he wants to recruit the replacement players to finish the regular season for the Sentinels. Yeah, like, was he going to start the XFL? Like, why are you watching these players who aren't really players? Yes. Clifford Franklin is a fucking grocery store clerk, dude. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Like, you're verging on stalking because he hasn't played any football at all. Yeah, he's, he's got files. He's a fast grocery store clerk. He's got files on these guys. Like, here's here's the folder on fucking on Shane Falco. Like, Shane Falco should be the only one that you should have kept an eye on. Like, oh, he disappeared, oh, yeah. but I know he's doing this. Everybody else is literally just doing regular day to day jobs. And yeah, like, and I, I got news for all you would be coaches out there keeping dossiers, <laughs> detailed dossiers on fucking policemen is probably going to get you put in jail. So McGinney then recruits the group of former football players who never made it anywhere, along with a soccer player, the sumo wrestler, to fill out said roster. And he mm -hmm. also brings in Shane Falco. And we see the team on their first day of practice, and Annabelle is also looking for replacement cheerleaders as we see a montage of the ship bags that she brings in for tryouts. I thought that was a nice touch. It's a great touch. It's incredibly funny. Mm -hmm. um, but I also have a don't do that. Don't do that. It's not good for you. Hi, writers. Um, know the topic 
that you're writing about or do some fucking research on that topic before you write said movie or book or whatever. They don't need replacement coaches, cheerleaders, water boys, or whatever the hell else you threw in here. I know it's for comedic relief and I totally get that. But also, when the players go on strike, it's just the players. It's the players union that goes on strike. And while the whole cheerleader thing is funny, bringing McGinney in is good, and it makes the movie better. You could have done it in a different way. Just, just do a, just a smidge of research on especially in a sports movie. Like when I see some of these things, I'm like, uh, when Gene Hackman tells one of his coaches when they're talking about Roy from the office and mm -hmm. he's the deaf tight end and he's like, here's the positive. You'll never be called off sides on an audible. They don't jump off sides because they're on the offense. Those are false starts, little stupid things like that. And I know nobody else gives a fuck about it really bothered me as far as the writing goes. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. Kids, we're going to take you behind the curtain real quick. I got fucking read on a group text thread about the pain it is watching a movie with me that is not a comedy. You took me to task, sir, over my take of Don't Worry, Darling. Because <laughs> I dare to disagree with the masses. Is it possible this story is true? Yes, it is. Now you have the balls to come back and actually nitpick a comedy? Yes, I do. Me, in front of me? Yes. Fuck you. <laughs> Listen. Suck a bag of uh, dicks, I, sir. I, I love this movie. I think it's great. Just some of the inconsistencies as far as that goes kind of got under my skin a little bit. That's all I'm saying. That's how, I'm, that's how I describe you right now. I love you, <laughs> but some of your inconsistencies are getting under my fucking skin. Hell yes. Annabelle here then hires a group of strippers from the local strip club by the airport to be the Sentinel cheerleaders. I know you're probably going to crush me for this too, but if the strippers are from the local strip club that's next to the airport, they don't look like those cheerleaders. <laughs> no, that's accurate. That's, there's a, I will give you this. There's some long shots where the cheerleaders are just doing, you know, like cutaway shots and shit like that. Yeah. There's a few in the group. Absolutely worked at the airport. hundred <laughs> percent. Totally buy it. But yeah, the, the two main uh, dancers in this, uh, in this moment, they don't work. So the Sentinels here have to play the last four games of the regular season, and they lose the first game using replacement players. They're unorganized. They're fighting each other throughout the game, but they pull it together enough to make it a game. But at the end, Falco gets scared. He changes out of the play call that McGinney calls to a running play, and they end up losing the game. Now, let me ask you this question, Mr. Technicality here, because... <laughs> As you can tell, I'm just a fan. Uh, <laughs> when you, so he calls down, he, he checks down to the running play, right? And he yeah. does get scared, and he, and he reads Blitz. He earnestly reads Blitz because there's a Blitz coming. Yes. The rest of the team is confused. Yes. And he pitches the ball to Preacher, who is able to almost get there. What is he, about three, four yards short? I, yeah, like two, like like the Titans beating the Rams in the Super Bowl short, yeah, like yeah, that yeah. close. So theoretically, Coach McGinty, that play would have worked if the rest of the team actually knew their fucking assignments. Yes, if they if they it's well, not it's not because he was scared. He read the right play and called the right audible. Literally, nobody else knew where to be. There's well, three, three or four were, guys tackling the running back at the end of the play. I have to presume they had a blocker somewhere on the field. <laughs> somewhere, you would, you would think. Um, with that said, they were at what, like the 15-yard line? 
roughly. Mm-hmm. You're not audibling into a goddamn running play with like three seconds left on the clock. <laughs> like that's just not happening. I and thought fa- it was genius. Falco <laughs> does nothing wrong. That night, the striking Sentinel players go to a bar. They pick a fight with the replacement players, which leads to a full-on bar brawl. And the replacement players all get arrested, and the the striking Sentinel pro guys all get let go. This is one of my. This is the scene of the movie for me. But we've gone far too long without talking about John Favreau. In this absolutely, role. absolutely. Holy shit, dude! He had never played a role like this, ever. He had never been that jacked, ever. Yeah. Dude. And I mean, don't, like, don't get me wrong. In Swinger, Swingers, he has a little baby fat on him. But like, when he has that scene in the wife beater, and they do like a side shot, you could tell he's got he's got muscle. He's not meat. Yeah. When they're actually focusing on John Favreau in this movie, dude, one, he looks fantastic. And I think this is kind of what led him into some of those other roles, like in the breakup where he's playing a psycho. You know what I mean? In yeah. Bane, where he's playing a boxer and a little bit more of a tough guy. Like, I think this kind of led him into that. And two. He is so fucking funny, is that character. Absolutely. And he plays it so straight. <clears throat> it is unbelievably good. I, I did not realize, with all the movies we've done with Favreau in them as either the star or a bit part, and his uh, uh, work behind the camera, what he did with like Marvel and the, uh, getting Iron Man to be what it was, the Mandalorian, uh, on Disney Plus, dude, I admire that dude so much. In the in the first game, when you know one of the best scenes with Favreau is when you know Hackman tells him, "I need the ball, get me the ball," <laughs> and he comes back, he does it, he causes the fumble, strips the guy. The ball! You got me the ball! Me the ball! You got me the, me the ball! Go sit down now, Danny. That is fucking brilliant, and yeah. I challenge you, if you fancy yourself an actor. Do that scene with a friend. That's hard as shit to do. Yeah. To do it that with that kind of timing. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, just, I, I really am. I am a fan of John Favreau. In this scene, when they're when they're in jail, this is where we get the team building chemistry through the fight, and then being in jail together and doing their little line dance. And McGinney sees this and he's pissed, but he's like, oh, chemistry and things. I don't get too hyped up on racial shit, but it is pretty amazing. The difference in how the electric slide looks when it is being led by a predominantly black group of people versus a predominantly white group of people. Okay, if you watch this scene, because I noticed this, this was one of the things that jumped off the screen at me. Um. You know, Orlando Jones and, and, and the other dudes there. They're, and actually, even uh, Murphy, the tight end, mm-hmm. um, Favreau does a pretty decent job. Mm-hmm. But my God, Keanu Reeves has zero soul. <laughs> oh. He's got no groove in his in his meat suit. Nothing. It's, they do a tight shot of his work boots attempting to slide and that is the most uh, it looks like he's has a walker and he's trying to shuffle it through a walmart dude when they do when the when the when it's the wide shot of everybody if you look at every because it's i don't know 10 15 seconds but if you look at everybody and just pan from left to right and it's like, oh, Favreau's doing a good job. These guys are all doing, look at this. Everybody's got some soul. Everybody's got a little groove. And then you see Keanu. And yeah. he is just struggle bussing it through the whole <laughs> goddamn thing. And it's the electric slide, too. Yeah. It's not the most like, difficult dance to perform. No. no. Come on, man. Uh, I paid money to see that dude attempt to do the Roger Rabbit, though. Straight up. <laughs> <laughs> So after this, they win their next two games, both in the final seconds of each game. And now they only need one more game and one more win to make the playoffs. So that night, O'Neill tells McGinney that Eddie Martell has crossed the picket line and he will be reactivated by the Sentinels for the final game of the season. And he wants McGinney. He doesn't want McGinney 
to start him. He's demanding that McGinty start Martell because he is the all-star NFL, whatever league this is, quarterback, yes. and he's way better than Shane Falco. And there's yep. a, a big fight and a big blow up about this, but McGinty obviously has to do what he's told by the owner. And so he goes and tells Falco that he's not playing. And then Falco goes to the bar, tells the team, yada, yada. This is the one question that I have, okay? Because the other team, I think they're playing like Dallas or wh- whoever in the last game. Yeah. Their entire team has crossed the picket line. So mm-hmm. it's all 22 pro starters on that team playing against replacement players and Eddie Martell, one guy. Mm-hmm. First of all, th- that's you're going to get your star quarterback, your million dollar quarterback killed. Okay. Mm. That's one. Just play Falco. Okay. But two, if Martell comes in and is the star, the whole, their whole team didn't cross the picket line. Falco would be the backup. Falco just takes this as like, I'm off the team and he just leaves. Yeah. They have no backup <laughs> whatsoever. Is it possible this story is true? Yes, it is. Yeah, this is the one. This is one of the few things I know. You were pissy about the writing earlier, so I'm going to take my turn now. Because O'Neill tells McGinty, you know, hey, there are fifty some other odd guys down there, depending on you as well. Like you can't just make this emotional decision. McGinty knows how much this team has rallied behind Shane. He knows that Shane is his leader in that clubhouse. So the obvious reply is, cool, let's get them all up here and see what they have to say about it then. They're all replacement players too. You're acting like, you know, you got guys who's, we got playoff bonuses depending on this and da-da-da-da because there are so many incentives built into contracts anymore. You're acting like that's the case. No, these guys got paid a flat fee to show the fuck up. Yeah, that's it. There are no incentives in Shane Falco or any other player on that field's contract other than Martell at that moment. And if O'Neill is really such a penny pinching bitch about everything, he would sit Martell so Martell can't make a fucking bonus. <laughs> Absolutely. Great. You cross the picket line. Sit down and shut the fuck up. End of the discussion. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. That was my one the, problem with that. I, and I know you needed to advance the sh- movie well, yeah. and have the big triumphant return. Obviously, that needs to be there. But I wish there was more of a fight from Hackman's standpoint. The other thing that th- that's really real is when they get to the game and that first sn- their first offensive snap and the offensive linemen go, just let them through. Let him fucking crush this dude. That's really real, and that really happens. Yep. Just as an <clears throat> FYI, if your quarterback is a dick, disrespects some people on the team, whatever the hell, those offensive linemen are just going to go, there you go. <laughs> go hit that yep. guy as hard as you Have can. At it. Yeah, man, you can't. That, it, it seems like such a funny cliche, and if you don't like sport ball, it's kind of dumb. Yeah. Caddy. Uh, childish even just how it sounds but that the quarterback really is the leader of that team and if they don't respect you they don't like you see ya we'll get rid of you one way or another hell yes and just because the the payoff isn't awesome the one thing i didn't like is after after falco gets the news right and he's mm-hmm. like, well, I'm not the backup. I'm just not here anymore. So I'm going to leave. He he does. He goes on his little, you know, JCVD, like walk of shame or whatever the hell. He I stand- can't play football no more. <laughs> I'm back on the boats. So he he goes on, on his little walk of shame and he stands up Annabelle on a date that he had planned with her because he's sad and things. Well, because Martell says she deserves better than you. She deserves better. I am all for a love triangle or whatever the fuck is trying to happen here. 
way too late for Eddie Martell to come in and decide he has feelings for Annabelle this entire time. What the fuck well, are you talking about? Okay, I'm glad you're on board with this because up until this point, there's l- zero indication Nothing. that that Martell and Annabelle had a thing or he has a thing for they're not even they don't even share the screen together at all throughout this movie. The only no. time you see it is when Martell in this last game gets on the field and he's looking over at Annabelle and there's that like quick back and forth of like, I'm staring at you because feelings and things. Yeah. And you're just like, "Mm, did a scene get cut out? Because I'm confused. Because yeah, like she makes a she makes a couple comments about how she doesn't date quarterbacks or doesn't date football players, especially quarterbacks, because they're the biggest babies. Yeah. Well, that's kind of true. So that's just a blanket statement. It's not like because Eddie Martell is the biggest baby I've ever met. Yeah. Or anything like that. You know what I mean? There's there is nothing to indicate that this was actually a thing at all until the it was just like fuck it. He has to stand her up for some reason. Yeah. Eddie Mar- Eddie Martell's now going to get into his head. Yeah, that was really I didn't guy like I that. Get you the whole time, and even is talking shit to you as you're packing up your gear and leaving. Yeah. Goes, she deserves better, and you're like, "Fuck, he's right." You're you're totally this, right. This is where he's right. We then get to the final game of the season. Martell <clears throat> pulls his prima donna shit, gets into a fight with Coach McGinney at halftime, with the Sentinels down seventeen nothing. Falco enters the locker room. And says, remember when Bobby Boucher showed up at halftime when the Mud Dogs won the Bourbon Bowl, do ya? The rest of the team kicks Martell out of the locker room. And this is where you don't get the the, the payoff isn't there. Because Falco runs out. And then you get R.I.P. John Madden. You get John Madden. Oh, Falco's coming out onto the field. And it looks like he wants to play. Because I could totally tell from his eyes up here. But he runs out onto the field, runs to Annabelle, apologizes, and then they kiss. He's necking with that cheerleader. I was going to say, it's one of my favorite lines in the movie. Um, but, like, the like you, you stood her up, and then you just run out on the field like, I, I'm sorry, it, whatever. And then you just, and everything's, cool. like, the payoff just wasn't there for that. Like. Yeah, no, it was. Oh. Almost like he was late to dinner, but didn't apologize or, you know what I yeah. mean? Like maybe she had to pay for the bill because he forgot his wallet at home. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. Like hands her 20 bucks and gives her a kiss. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck. It just seems, it seemed very, <laughs> it seemed very kind of vanilla for what we were going for. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. They were it was almost like again, the writers were just like, well, we have to have some sort of conflict between, you know, the the guy and the girl that are, you know, there there has to be some strain in their relationship for a half a second. But then how do we get over it? Well, he just apologizes and everything's fine. Then he goes and plays football in the second half. <laughs> so we get to the second half of this game. Preacher runs for a 99-yard touchdown. He blows out his knee. So the Sentinels cut the lead to 17-14 after their second touchdown. And with only a few seconds left in the game, they line up for a field goal to tie the game. But when Nigel gets set, he tells Falco he can't kick the field goal because he gambled and there are semi-bad dudes that want to take his pub. Corey's Life Lessons! Hi, gangsters. Uncle Corey here. If your intimidation tactic is to file your nails, stop being a gangster. That's not intimidating. When did... I want to know... I want to know... You see my nail file? My cuticles look fucking great. How's that going to feel on your face? You're already wearing... You're the old guy in the group, and you're wearing a fucking velvet tracksuit. Don't be filing your nails. You should be at a Denny's. You're not out trying to intimidate fucking bums who are losing their fucking I, money. Get I the want to know. Here, I want to know at what point in, in in U.S. history, like I want to know the year that this stopped becoming a thing. 
Because in 2000, when you wanted to beat somebody up, you didn't do this. Okay. Yeah. That's how I know you're a fake ass gangster. Yeah. If you wanted to beat him, you would have just beat him. Yeah. The, there's one guy who looks like a gangster. The other guy looks like Doogie Hauser's best friend. And the other guy should be at a Bennigan's ordering the fucking sunny side up breakfast. Fuck I'll, out take, of here. I'll take the moons over my hammy. <laughs> <laughs> so Falco then takes the snap for the kick, pulls it out from under Nigel, runs it all the way for a touchdown, but it's brought back by a holding penalty. Falco then tells McGinty that he wants the ball for the last play. Falco throws a touchdown pass to the tight end, Brian Murphy, Roy from the office, and the Sentinels win 20 to 17, sending them to the playoffs. And the film ends with a voiceover from McGinty talking about glory lasting forever and some other uplifting stuff about heart and things. Again, going back to, and some people might like this. I didn't like this the first time I saw it. I still don't like it. This is a comedy. Can we just keep it there? Have the movie end with them celebrating because this... Because literally, like, the next day, the strike's over. The next day, the, the players are coming in. They all lose their jobs, for the most part. So, can't we just have them celebrating the fact that they overcame and they won? We know it's about glory and lasting forever and heart and things and overcoming adversity. And yeah, We know that as the audience. You always talk about, if you treat the audience like a bunch of dumbasses, mm -hmm. they, they will... Like, this... This voiceover, and I know I might get a, a little too upset about this, but this voiceover treats the audience like they're fucking stupid. No, I don't think, I think everybody pretty much expected this level of anger from you because we know how <laughs> pissed you get when people try to uplift you. But, that's, that's spot on, spot on. We, we know that now about you. So we're, we're all pretty much there with you. We are, we're like, yeah, of course he had that reaction. No, I think the only reason I, I I I'll agree with you with the fact that it was a little over the top. You have to do it because it's a sports movie, and you have to do it because you have Gene Hackman playing a coach. Yes. It's like if you have Morgan Freeman in a movie and he doesn't narrate a portion of it, <laughs> you've just wasted Morgan Freeman. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Gene Hackman as a coach has to give some kind of speech. But I agree with you. In this movie, in that moment, it's a little too fucking dramatic and it's, a little it's a too bit much. Uh, yeah, I can't think well, of a this word. Isn't, it's just a little yeah. Listen, it's just too much. If if, if you want to throw a voiceover like this, which happens at the end of movies like Remember the Titans or fucking Radio Hoosiers. or Hoosiers or whatever. You want to throw a voiceover like that. Yeah. It just to me it seemed it seemed too heavy yes. for the lighthearted comedy that it was. Yep. Agree. But again, agree. Whether it's oh, he said offsides instead of uh false start. He blah, 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 whatever. Cheerleaders aren't getting replacement players or whatever. Those are like so minute as far as issues oh, that sure. I have. The voiceover at the end. Ooh, I turned it off before the voiceover finished, just FYI. So because I just didn't care about it. It doesn't ruin the movie. You know what I mean? This movie, I still love it. I find it hilarious every time. I watch it. Um, one of my favorite scenes that we skipped over in the last game when they come back, though, and mm -hmm. it's one of my favorite lines outside of he's necking with that cheerleader is <laughs> Orlando Jones because they smother his hand <laughs> yep. and stick him. And he goes, it looks like I jacked off an elephant. Coach, I look like I just jacked off an elephant. Hey, it's so you understand. But just the way he delivers it, how he's holding his hands. Just that whole scene makes me laugh out loud every fucking time I see it. Is it possible this story is true? Yes, it is. No, this this is by far, I mean, clearly it's my favorite football movie. I'm wearing the work shirt of a fictional person. So it is by far my favorite football movie. 
I I genuinely like even the corny parts, the Gene Hackman, the the parts that don't make sense. They're there. They're there in a lot of these movies. Oh, absolutely. And I'm fine with it. it you know, it does great on me every time. I'm just like, Ugh. but at the same time, I fucking love this movie. It's 100%. just it's fun. It That's why I like outside it. Outside of a couple moments, it doesn't take itself too seriously. They really only focus on Keanu as kind of the like protagonist. With a big cast like this, you have a lot of guys whose backgrounds you're really going to get into yeah, and yeah, their yeah. struggles and what they've been going through, much like what the program did, right? Yep. You had five or six different guys going through five or six different fucked up things. Yeah. This just focused on Keanu. And him trying to get that second chance and kind of that self plug your ears, believing in yourself, kind of feeling back. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, man. Gross. I know you're gonna I know you're gonna hurl in a second. Oh. Um but yeah, like that is what made it tolerable in those moments for me. You know, if we had to get into John Favreau's wife and kids left him and Earl was set up by Crooked Cop. It's just like, Jesus fucking Christ. Is this a comedy or a social commentary? Yeah, exactly. So, so they, they kept it in the lane. They should have with just focusing on the one character and everything else just played out really well. I really liked it. I like, I just, I love this movie. I got nothing bad to say about this movie. No, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. I, I love, Loved it when it came out. Love it to this day. And I'll keep loving it. And Go Shane Falco. I'm going to keep on loving you. That's I can't right. hit that higher register. I would have sang it, but I can't get there. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, uh, for Corey, I'm Armando. This is Kiss the Reviews. And this was 2000's The Replacements. <laughs>